So my name is Judith Sakairos. I'm a project engineer here at Risk Management Professionals. And today we're going to be going over management of change and pre-startup safety review uh, topic. And we're going to go over kind of the regulations, obviously, uh, an overview of the, the regulations and how we've come to where we are with the, the safety culture and implementation of MOC and pre-startup safety review. And then we will follow up with some uh, topics on common deficiencies and as well as um, implementation of the actual um, MOC and PSSR to try to avoid those deficiencies and just in overall to um, implement the, the MOC and PSSR fully. So the key topics that we'll be discussing today are going to be a review of the MOC and pre-startup safety regulations, uh, lessons learned, common deficiencies, implementation, and I, as I said previously, then we'll open it up to Q&A. Okay. So we're going to focus on driving forces in the evolution of process safety and risk management regulatory requirements. Uh, you're going to see on the slide a few pictures of some previous pretty catastrophic incidents. And the question is, how, how does it get to this point? And before, there was a different safety culture, and since then, uh, there have been regulations that have been put in place to try to mitigate the potential for these types of events and to try to control uh, hazards associated with chemical plants and hazardous materials. Listed uh, on this slide, there's just going to be a, a list of significant process safety incidents. If you go to the Chemical Safety Board, if you look these up online, you can find out all the details of the different safety incidents. Um, most of these are going to be, uh, have occurred obviously due to uh, mainly human error, uh, procedural issues, um, some process safety uh, failures, and uh, the, the, the intent is to uh, kind of look at all those different things and make sure that the changes are controlled uh, in a safe manner and that these types of incidents can be uh, prevented. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at a few incidents, kind of go through them, because it's important to discuss uh, these types of incidents to see where, where we were then and um, to what place we are now with, with, with the regulatory initiative that has put in, been put in place to try to um, develop that safety culture to mitigate those types uh, so that we don't see catastrophic uh, incidents as uh, the ones that we're going to be looking at right now. Uh, so I think everyone's familiar with Bhopal, India, 1984. There's a methyl isocyanate release. Uh, and there's just going to be a few uh, causes uh, to, that contributed to this incident. Uh, most of you may be familiar with this. Uh, procedural errors resulting in relative chemistry incident. So there was a runaway reaction. Uh, there was uh, a reaction with water in the reactor, uh, which resulted in, in a significant release. But it wasn't limited just to that. Um, essentially, the theory there was that uh, when they were doing maintenance for the piping, there was water that was real, that uh, a slip line wasn't put in place to isolate the water. And so the water got into the, uh, the, the tank uh, containing the methyl isocyanate, and, which resulted in the reaction and resulted in the release. But in addition to that, uh, the contributing factors to that was that there were key control systems disabled, which made the release a lot worse. There were key protection systems disabled. Um, and both without MOC uh, being conducted, so obviously that, that went unattended for a while. Um, the control systems that were disabled was, uh, there was a refrigeration system that was not in place due to economic issues. So the tank was actually um, maintained at a higher temperature. And then there were key protection systems that were supposed to try to help and maybe could have possibly mitigated the, the escalation of that release. And, and uh, there may have been some sort of release, but not to the magnitude. Uh, that it resulted in. Those were um, the flare system and the scrubber system. The scrubber system was not online. Um, 
and obviously has not been considered as part of the management of change procedure because then they would have conducted a review and realized that that's something that needs to be in place and is a criti critical uh, feature to the system. And so they didn't have their caustic uh, soda uh, available to try to scrub the, the um, methyl isocyanate, which meant that everything was releasing to the atmosphere. So that uh, resulted in a 40 ton release into the community. 4,000, uh, the range is 4,000 to, I believe, 8,000 um, on the records. And um, currently, they have estimated it's about 20,000 deaths um, you know, due, due to the diseases that people um, got from that, from that exposure level. Uh, and also, uh, obviously, a large amount of permanent injuries resulted from that. So it was a catastrophic release that if uh, we maybe had the regulatory initiatives that we do now in the safety culture could have been uh, prevented. Okay, the Piper Alpha platform, 1988, the gas condensate vapor cloud that was generated. So this was another one that really started opening people's eyes and they started saying like, okay, there's something that needs to be done because this, uh, this type of um, event, catastrophic event, is really not acceptable. Uh, we have to conduct our, our processes in, in a responsible manner and, and go through and make sure that safety is first. Um, and what happened there was that there was a work permit system that was not operating the way it should be, um, and essentially it was disregarded. Uh, I think they issued like two work permits. One was for uh, to maintain the spare pump and another one to replace the relief valve on that pump. They didn't get to the relief valve that night, so they were gonna finish it later, but the work permit was closed out even though the, the job wasn't. And so next shift came in, they started the pump, uh, but they had no idea that the work permit uh, for the relief valve still existed and, um, and that it hadn't been replaced. And so then they got a vapor release and a cloud accumulated, significant explosion, um, and they had 167 lives lost. Um, another outcome, uh, a contributing factor to the magnitude of that event was that they had very poor emergency response training at the time. It wasn't really a fully developed program. They actually sheltered in place, um, even though you know the event was escalating, and, and they, they probably should have at that point known to, or, or been trained to uh, evacuate and try, try to go to the waters. Uh, observations for major incidents, safety management system concepts. So the main cause, um, or the main, main result from major accidents, obviously, uh, they cause significant loss of life, and that's the primary concern. Um, but as well, there are additional um, indirect costs, and, and they're relatively significant because they can result in significant business interruption lost confidence in contracts, and increased regulation. Uh, typical characteristics of major accidents, uh, they're relatively simple precursors and initiating events, and given the right management system, should be uh, mitigated and, and easily corrected. The root causes failure to maintain design intent. So most of these times, it's just alleviating from the process design intent. And essentially, that's what we're going to be talking about today when we're discussing management of change. It's the purpose of management of change and pre-start of safety review is to maintain your design intent. Um, okay, and the most effective mechanism for improvement, uh, not by addressing the specific actions. So obviously, when there's a, a, an event that occurs, you need to look at what the root cause is. Uh, but Ultimately, the bigger picture is to affect changes in the way business is done. So really implementing that safety culture and the management system to mitigate those specific actions from occurring in, in the future. Okay. Evolution of process safety, risk management guidelines and regulations. Now we're just gonna kind of go over the different regulations that have evolved over time to address process safety. Um, onshore, uh, you have CCPS in 1987, 1990 gave rise to API RP70, 1992 gave way to PSM, Process Safety Management, 1996 
RMP um, via EPA, uh, so the risk management plan. And if you look at the offshore management systems below, there were um, there have been a series and uh, of regulations. Of, actually, there were standards, and now uh, they are actually going more towards the regulatory um, field. And um, after the the event horizon. Okay, regulatory initiatives. Industry initiatives were absorbed into performance management system-based federal regulatory requirements. So this is your OSHA uh, process safety management in 1992. In 1996, as was uh, described on the previous slide, the risk management program uh, for chemical accidental release prevention was put in place. And they essentially are very similar in the regulations. Um, Obviously, the PSM is uh, process safety management is regulated by OSHA, and the risk management program is part of EPA's jurisdiction. Uh, very similar programs, although process safety is specifically concerned with uh, employee safety, and risk management program is looking at uh, preventing releases that affect the environment. Uh, furthermore, uh, just as a side note, California also has uh, some regulatory initiatives. I know some of our viewers are California. Based and there is a process safety management of acutely hazardous materials. So OSHA has uh, um, established a, a California division, and essentially California facilities uh, fall under the Cal OSHA PSM jurisdiction. Um, usually, when they have a local jurisdiction, they are um, a little more um, stringent and they, uh, they uh, modify the regulations to uh, address additional concerns, typically. Uh, California also has the California Accidental Release Prevention Program, known as the CALARP program. And essentially, that is uh, pretty close in, in regulations to the EPA Risk Management Plan. Um, but there are at local administering agencies that need to be coordinated with under this program. Uh, and, and so that's separate from any EPA reporting. Uh, so the CalArp uh, requires uh, heavy involvement with that, with the local administering agencies, also known as CUPAs. Okay. And so lessons learned. So all of these regulations, they come from somewhere. They're, the intent is to improve something, and they have evolved over time due to lessons learned and, and previous incidents that have occurred. Equilon Enterprises, uh, Ana Cortez, the event was loss of electric power and steam supply, abnormal process conditions. So this is something that was not standard to their um, application, to their process, uh, and that resulted in different actions being taken. Um, and so what happened is that there, there was inadequate cooling emptying of the partially uh, filled drum. So before we go into that, we should give an overview. Yeah, so this was the delayed coking unit. And so this drum that we're referring to um, was partially filled, and it started uh, accumulating. Uh, because they lost the electric power and the steam supply, they, became, uh, they began to get plugging in the piping, and you know, the coke was uh, there was a partially filled drum, and then it started developing a, a layer of, of uh, solid solidification. And uh, they were unable to uh, inject steam at that point due to the plugging. Uh, however, to evacuate the contents of that drum is, they found in 1996 previously, that it, it can be a pretty uh, dangerous thing to do because they're, uh, is accumulation of the oil, hot pressurized oil inside that drum. And they, uh, there was an instruction to actually uh, develop uh, a procedure, which was actually not completed. Uh, and so what resulted in this incident was that there was inadequate cooling and thing of the partially filled drum. And it was a series of events that led to them. But initially, they, the, the supervisor knew that he he probably, that's from the 1996 incident, that he couldn't actually 
just open that up because you get this uh, vapor cloud. Um, so they let it cool, but there was a, a gauge that they were referencing that wasn't in the right location for the temperature, and it was actually giving a, a, a low temperature reading, which to them uh, implied that they were going to be okay pretty soon to open up that vessel since uh, the temperature wasn't hot. hot. Uh, however, what happened was that there was an outer core of, uh, of solid coke, and the, the inner core was still uh, hot vapor, um, well, hot pressurized oil. And uh, they thought that leaving it overnight was going to just, you know, cool it down enough to the point where they could just open it up in the morning, um, introduce water in there to cool it down. Uh, when in fact, if they would have had conducted a study, they would have realized that to get that level of heat transfer out of that core with the expected temperatures would have taken a few weeks. And so it was a combination of uh, inadequate personnel, uh, expertise, uh, inadequate readings or misunderstanding of instrumentation uh, and where it's applied, and also um, lack of uh, operating procedures. Uh, since they had the information and they knew that this was a concern, um, you know, there should have been written procedures to kind of document this concern and the risk associated with it. There should have been a risk analysis conducted um, to, uh, so that operations, maintenance, engineering are all on the same page and they know what the proper steps are to sa safely evacuate material out of there. But that wasn't done. So the hop uh, when they did open it up, they had a vapor cloud because the water reacted with the hot material and it began to flash. And when they opened, they had a vapor cloud, and which caused a, a, a significant fire and caused six fatalities. So the, un, the lessons learned here in terms of uh, MOC, because that's what we're going to be focusing on today, is that you need to have policies, uh, MOC policies, including abnormal situ situations, cha any changes to procedures and any deviations from standard operating procedures. And management uh, responsibilities to gather the right people and resources to review the situation. Okay. Uh, another lesson learned was the criticality of written procedures, including variance procedures, consideration of need for formal hazard analysis. So variance procedures uh, should require explanation of uh, a deviation plan, reasons necessary, safety and health, environmental considerations, and control measures to be taken, and, and the duration. Um, so the point of that is that that's not your normal operating procedure. So I, if there are certain processes, or in, in your process there are certain procedures that you might take on a temporary basis, uh, and they deviate from your standard uh, you know, operating procedures, operating limits, operating parameters. If they, if there's a deviation, it's important to track that as a, as a management of change and then develop procedures for that type of uh, task and also uh, validate that it's not going to result in, in a safety hazard. Okay. And the deep water horizon, 2010. Uh, so this event, it's not funny, uh, it was cement and valving was, that was to stop oil and, okay, so I have a little disclaimer. <laughs> I'm not laughing at this incident because it's not funny, but I realized that earlier I said event horizon, which has no reference to this, so sorry about that, but the deep water horizon in 2010, uh, Cement and valving that was to stop oil and gas reaching the wall, wall pipe casing did not work. Uh, and there was a misreading of key pressure uh, test by staff, and the blowout preventer failed due to multiple uh, system inadequacies, which uh, resulted in, I believe, 11, 11 deaths. And I believe it was 17 injured. And so essentially, there was a nothing gas release that resulted in an explosion and a fire. Okay. 
Okay, so part of, and, and this uh, example is mainly, this was the BP incident investigation or accident investigation report that was developed. Um, and it's just to kind of highlight the sections in the report was where they actually reference the importance of management of change. And uh, obviously management of change wasn't the root cause, but it's important to note that management of change is one of the most critical elements of the prevention program because the point of the management of change is to provide a, a system to make sure that you go through all of your elements and uh, identify um, changes and, and procedures and, uh, you know, maintenance programs and uh, training that needs to be completed and updated so that um, communication and teamwork is there and you can develop that safety culture. So part of the conclusion stated that uh, the cement evaluation techniques conducted which was what failed, uh, did not satisfy applicable BP's engineering technical practice. Um, and mm, it, there's no proof to show that uh, prior to that event occurring, there was a formal management of change procedure or a risk assessment or a review of the uh, technical practice. And that was one of the things that most likely could have prevented, uh, you know, the, the consecutive uh, contributing factors because if a management of change is conducted, the intent is to structure a process and before, you know, conducting an activity that is actually not your standard practice to look at, okay, well, what are the steps that we need to take to make sure that we're not missing anything, that we're not deviating from a procedure, um, et cetera. And so, the overarching conclusion for key finding one from the report was that improved technical assurance, risk management, and management of change by the BP Macondo Well team could have raised awareness of the challenges of achieving zon zonal isolation and led to additional mitigation steps. Okay, and there is also another ex uh, excerpt here in red. Um, and so essentially, uh, there was a deviation in the centralizers that they use, but uh, although it's not believed that this actually resulted in, in the, the actual root cause release of the release, uh, they did mention that when concerns arose over what were thought to be incorrect centralizers, the BP Macondo Wall team did not follow a documented management of change process and therefore did not identify that um, the centralizers that they had received were, were the correct ones. Um, and so that just shows, uh, the intent of that is to show that the management of change uh, is used to systematically review a process change or um, you know, a proposed process change and, and go through all uh, the steps and review those changes with all the right personnel to um, have the, the level of expertise needed to conduct a change. Okay. So now we're going to kind of, we're going to go into the, the actual requirements. And so we kind of have, we've reviewed a few uh, incidents and, and kind of the, what has made uh, the CalRP, the RMP programs, the PSM programs, and uh, the evolution of those programs. And two of the elements, obviously, that we've been discussing um, prevention program elements are management of change and pre-startup review. And so those requirements uh, are as follows. The, the owner and operator shall establish and implement written procedures to manage changes, except for replacement in kinds to process chemicals. Um, equip, and so to process chemicals, technology, equipment, procedures, and changes to facility. So when we read replacement in kind, uh, it's important to note. So here, anytime you have a, manage, uh, a change to your process, you need to consider, okay, what is a is it a replacement in kind or is it not a replacement in kind? If it's not a replacement in kind, then you need to follow through with the MOC procedure. Uh, if it is a replacement in kind, then essentially there's not a requirement. So what is the difference between those or what constitutes a replacement in kind? A replacement in kind is essentially if you change out a pump for the same type of pump, same brand, the same capacity, the same design specification, then that, that's what is considered a replacement in kind. If you change the make of the pump uh, 
or the capacity if you change the manufacturer um, you have to really consider whether any of those changes can impact your system and so you need to go through the management of change process if you change our piping for the same material the same design specifications and it's just a direct replacement of the pipe for a different well the same pipe in that same location in that same configuration that would be a replacement in kind however if it's the same material but you're adding process flow uh, to a different destination then that's not a replacement in kind and that would issue uh, that would require a management of change to be issued uh, so when we look at process chemicals obviously if you change inventory um, technology if you have uh, if you're going to change your flows um, if you're going to change catalyst if you're going to uh, change uh, your equipment which is the next line item uh, procedures if you are going to make any changes to the procedures whether there are standard operating procedures or whether they're uh, maintenance procedures those types of changes need to be documented under management of change uh, and changes to facility. Changes to facility uh, essentially is put there to just get you thinking about in, in a more vague manner of any, any changes to your pro covered process or any changes to your facility that can affect your covered process the way it's handled uh, would constitute a management of change. So. Uh, under changes to facility, you could look at um, organizational changes. If you reduce the number of your employees that uh, affect the process, the covered process, you know, people are working on the procedure, I mean, on the process, and they're going to be delegated different procedures. Uh, they're going to have different shifts that are going to affect their work. Uh, those kind of changes need to be evaluated um, to verify the impacts on the process and to identify any potential safety concerns associated with those types of changes. Okay. Uh, the, the requirements also uh, state that uh, the, procedure, the MOC procedures shall assure that the following considerations are addressed prior in CAPS to any change. Uh, so the intent of the management of change is, you know, before the actual introduction of the chemical is made into the modified process you are verifying that uh, you have a sound technical basis for the change uh, you're going to look at impacts of, of the change on health uh, and safety uh, and obviously if any concerns are addressed those concerns will be addressed prior to the installation and um, starting up the, the process in its modified form uh, and that there's necessary time period to implement the change uh, and authorization requirements for the proposed change. Okay. Requirements also uh, involve employees involved in operating uh, process and maintenance and contract employees whose job tasks will be affected by change in the process shall be informed of and trained in the change prior to startup of the process or affected part of uh, the operation. So, it's not limited only to operating you know, personnel. Uh, if, if you have contractors who perform maintenance uh, and your system is changing, they need to be uh, informed of, of those changes as well. If the change results in change in the process safety information, such information shall be uh, updated. And obviously, the operating procedures, if they are impacted, they need to be updated as well as part of it. And we'll see. Okay, and then pre-startup safety review, uh, the requirements, the owner or operator shall perform a pre-startup safety review for new stationary sources and for modified stationary sources when the modification is significant enough to require a change in the process safety information. The way I usually look at this is that the pre-startup safety review uh, is kind of the check and balance to the MOC. Uh, the MOC is going to go through and, and make sure that you know, you're looking at your change in the systematic manners to, to identify any potential vulnerabilities, to identify any communication barriers, so any procedures, uh, any changes to your mechanical integrity that need to be evaluated, any changes to the drawing, uh, evaluation of codes and standards. And your pre-startup safety review is 
the check and balance. It's going to say, okay, now if you're getting ready to start up, have you done all of your MOC stuff? If it's a new installation, obviously it'll just go, it'll go through the checklist and make sure that you conducted your hazard review and that you've addressed any recommendations that have resulted from that evalu hazard uh, analysis evaluation. Okay. The pre-startup safety review will confirm that prior to the introduction of regulated substances to processes, to, to a process, construction and equipment are in accordance with applicable specifications. Your safety operator, operating maintenance and emergency procedures are in place. Uh, for new stationary, stationary sources, you have conducted your process hazard analysis or hazard review, depending on what program level you're in, and that recommendations have been resolved or implemented before startup, uh, and modified stationary sources meet the requirements contained in management of change. And so this usually takes some time. I mean, it's not something that you do on that day. Obviously, the pre-startup safety review uh, it's evaluating if you've, if you've uh, completed all the tasks, if you have all the documentation in place, if you've conducted all the training, and for, a PA, uh, for the process hazard analysis study, um, if any re recommendations result, those could be uh, design changes uh, for new facilities. They could be um, training requirements. They could be code issues. And so sometimes those can take a while to, to flush out, and so it's important that this, you know, both the MOC and the pre-startup safety review are conducted sequentially, but also with time so that uh, the facility can, you know, won't have that bottleneck, um, but can also look at all the different things that need to be evaluated to make sure uh, for a safe startup. Uh, and also training of each employee involved in operating a process has been completed. Okay. And there is an additional Cal OSHA PSM requirement line item in, in the Cal OSHA PSM regulations. Uh, the pre-start of safety review shall involve employees with expertise in process operations and engineering. The employees will be selected based upon their experience and understanding of the process system being evaluated. Okay, so common deficiencies and uh, implementation. Uh, if we look at common deficiencies, uh, the management of change uh, for the most part, so the big uh, ticket items are that the MOC procedure is uh, not exactly utilized in the manner it should be or is not current. Um, another item is program documentation is not updated to reflect a change. Uh, so the management of change is going to call for certain things. Uh, it's going to look at, it's, it's going to send a checklist to different personnel that are responsible for different uh, portions of the process and it's going to request uh, identifying if any updates need to be made. If uh, there are updates that need to be made, uh, those need to be followed through with. They need to be part of the MOC changes. They need to be input into the system uh, as, a, as a, the most current revision so that uh, communication can uh, occur and everyone is uh, aligned on the latest you know, procedures or, uh, or process changes. And Failure to review MOCs with employees and contractors. Uh, this is mainly due to documentation, so we'll discuss a little more on that. But uh, essentially, um, since the MOC requirement is that there is training that is conducted, as well as uh, reviewing the changes with employees and contractors, in order for it to have occurred, it needs to be documented. Uh, pre start of safety review. RAM procedures sometimes don't exist. That's a, a big one. Uh, Pre-startup review documentation is not completed or kept on file following implementation of the MOC procedure. And uh, documentation is not completed and signed off until after startup. Uh, again, the, the intention of the pro uh, pre-startup safety review is to conduct it before startup to ensure that you will have a safe startup, that you've addressed all of your documentation issues, that all your operations is trained, are trained on, on the changes, and they know upon starting up that system what they're responsible for and how to operate the system in its modified form. Okay, so common, and then just some common missing MOC elements. There's uh, some line items of 
things that are usually missing from or sometimes missing from the form or the procedure, uh, personnel or organizational, organizational changes are not considered. Uh, temporary changes need to be addressed, and so that should be part of the form, um, and including time limits and mechanisms to follow through. Uh, this one is usually a very big one because uh, temporary changes normally aren't designed to be permanent installations, and so the concern and over time, it's been more and more apparent through these documentation of incidents um, and, and tracking that documentation that uh, temporary changes tend to be a very large problem because, uh, you know, in the, in the industry, in, in process, maintaining the process, maintaining its efficiency, maintaining profits, maintaining a smooth operation uh, results for a very like, high-paced and a lot of tasks need to be done and everyone's kind of working together. But um, And so temporary changes sometimes kind of get lost in translation or tend to get lost in translation. And so the MOC is really the place where uh, it, it can control this type of change and make sure that, you know, a change that where you have temporary uh, piping that's not really uh, designed for a longer term because it could result in corrosion issues doesn't stay there that long, and that you have um, a document, you, know, you have a clear documentation uh, of why, and, and expressing those limitations, and documenting those time limits, and making sure that you know there's like a proctor, like an MOC proctor, who's monitoring those processes and and not letting uh, those types of temporary installations go uh, on for a prolonged period of time. Uh, failure to review MOCs with employees and contractors. Okay, we discussed already. Uh, okay, so MOC implementation. We have the first item that we looked at as a deficiency MOC procedure not current or used. Uh, the problem a lot of times is depending on the size of the facility. So if you're a large facility um, or a small facility, your management of change requirements are going to be different. Um, a lot of, and, and so the, there is that spectrum. The MOC procedures either are too complicated and not intuitive and maybe over involved, or they're too simple and they're like a rubber stamp document where you have this form and there's really not a lot of direction as to what the field means, who's responsible for those sections, and that can be as big of an issue as something that's too complicated and just no one, you know, uses it because it's not understandable. So in order to kind of, uh, what, what tends to work or what I've ten, tended to see work is that uh, if you engage departments in, de in the development of the procedure, you get a sense of what your facility needs. Uh, if you need to break your MOC procedure down into different sectors, you know, if you have an EHS department, uh, if and you have an engineering department who's going to take care of some of the other documentation, and you have operations department and maintenance that's going to take care of uh, other criteria of of the program that need, the prevention program that needs to be looked at. Then uh, and then you have uh, someone who's kind of just the overviewer, and they're going to look and make sure that all those departments are staying on track with the target completion dates and collecting all the information. That may work if it's for a more complicated facility. Uh, with a more complex process, that is probably what's needed. But obviously, that's not necessary for a plant with um, with a single, uh, you know, coordinator, program coordinator, and uh, there's really not a lot of different departments. And essentially, one person would probably carry out most of the tasks. So a procedure like that would be too involved, and, and not is not really going to be carried out because there's just going to be a, a overload of paperwork that's not necessary. So it's important to engage the departments and come to develop a procedure that works for you that um, is elaborate enough for your type of, of system. Uh, and also the procedure, because usually, because usually you have a form, your management of change form, and that's like your checklist. That's what you use to track everything that has dates. However, uh, you need to have a, a, a management of change procedure which defines what are your roles and responsibilities. Who's doing what? Who's going to archive where? 
and, and that really needs to be clearly identified so that you can use it too in conjunction. Uh, and uh, flow charts to go along, so visual representations uh, that go along with the procedural steps um, can be a good idea. An example is shown here. Uh, and you, it, it's usually a very good idea because this is one of the more confusing areas or, or that is confused um, to provide examples of in-kind versus not in-kind changes. Um, OSHA has a lot of good examples of, of that, of in-kind versus not in-kind, and they, you know, you can develop tables based on that information to show. Um, and, you know, eventually when you get used to it, you, you, whoever is completing the MOCs will not need it. But as a starter, if, uh, if personnel are not very intimate with the MOC process, uh, those kind of tables can be really helpful because, uh, you know, in-kind versus not-in-kind changes, we're, as we talked about, they can be procedural changes, they can be equipment, they can be process technology, you know, control systems, interlocks, if you're changing set points, um, things that maybe intu intuitively might seem like a, an in-kind change may actually not be because they can uh, impact your system. Uh, one good example is the control systems and set points. It, it, it may seem intuitive that just changing that is not really going to affect anything, but if they're critical safety devices, um, it could it could result in, in adverse impacts to your process. So those types of things are important to consider when determining what in-kind versus not in-kind changes, and tables can usually be a, a really big help um, in when you're you know, getting to know the MOC process. Um, number two, program documentation not updated. So this is what we were, were discussing earlier, check and balance. The pre-start of safety review is in place to ensure documentation is updated before commissioning. Uh, you, it's, it's a good idea to maintain a master copy uh, of the program documentation and always update revisions to modify documents when I go to facilities, this is usually a big deal, like a big issue because revision, revisions tell you, you know, they tell a story of what's happening to your process. You look at your PNIDs, your drawings, and you have different revision numbers with box and it's identifying what those changes are and usually has some bubbled in information. Uh, looking at your process safety information section that shows your operating parameters. Um, Revisions of identifying uh, a revision log, identifying what those changes are, and making them synchronize with your MOC documentation um, just really helps alleviate a lot of headaches and a lot of tracking issues, um, and it takes a minute. So it's really important to always update the revision information. Uh, maintain equipment manuals, and, and all, obviously the, the previous uh, item I was going over can result in deficiencies because then you can't find the documentation that you're looking for when you need it, um, or to communicate or to train. So it's, it's vital. Uh, maintaining equipment manuals, UNA forms for pressure vessels, uh, et cetera, that's very important for your uh, MOC implementation. That's one of the requirements for uh, process safety information, and it's what's going to tell you what your operating parameters are and if there are any changes, and uh, if the operations need to adjust to those changes when they're operating the system. So maintaining that information archived is uh, important, and getting rid of things that are not applicable anymore, um, whether you archive it in a different place, is also very important to avoid confusion of what your current installation uh, is. Uh, keeping files associated with the MOC, uh, with the MOC forms, uh, usually uh, is a very good way of ensuring that your documentation is updated as part of the MOC process. So with an MOC process, you may have some changes to your procedures. You may change some frequencies on your, uh, on your maintenance tasks or in your preventative maintenance uh, program. You may have to change drawings. You may have to, uh, you will have to conduct training. All of that information needs to be tracked with the MOC. So whether you make a revision or a, a list, 
as part of your MOC package and you reference all the different documents that were updated or if you have that, uh, if you have a system on an internal drive where that's, uh, you know, on an internet, a facility internet, or if it's just a paper document, if your facility is not complex, it doesn't need that level of uh, technology and a paper copy is fine, but you're maintaining all the different records as a package, uh, that needs to be done so that you avoid the deficiency of not uh, having the, the program documentation being updated. Uh, one option is considering uh, keeping digital copies of documentation to decrease the chances of losing files and, and, and increase uh, organization. Okay. The third item is uh, the failure to review MOCs with employees and contractors. Uh, to resolve this, and you just have to ensure that MOC procedures require training for any effective on any effective procedures or changes in process parameters for both employees and contractors. Um, oftentimes, contractors are not included. There's no documentation for them. Uh, and even if the change does not result in any procedural changes, you know, you should conduct an overview and document because if it's not documented, the regulations say it doesn't happen. Okay, and so for PSSR implementation, uh, to alleviate, you know, procedures not existing and documentation not being completed or kept on file following implementation, uh, an effective pre-start of safety review procedure and checklist should be avail available. Uh, you can maintain, and the initial PSSR should be archived uh, for the life of the facility, uh, and there should also be completed checklists which either reference the corresponding uh, MOC or you attach it to the MOC package. A lot of the times it's uh, when you have an MOC, uh, obviously you have to conduct a PSSR uh, to finalize the process before startup. And so the two should correlate uh, and there should be some reference, uh, you know, between the two documents. And a lot of times it's easy to just maintain them together uh, as a whole. Um, but however you do it, just you just need to figure out a mechanism to make sure that they reference each other and that they relate to each other. Uh, if PSSR procedure also includes a safety review specification checklist, consider implementing a prioritization ranking to clearly define which items to do before and after the PSSR. So if in addition to the regulatory pre-startup safety review checklist per the regulations, if you have a, a specification checklist where you're going to look at construction and design, um, questions, you know, um, the piping issues, uh, siding issues as part of your safety review. Those, um, some of those may not, uh, you may not be able to do them prior to the startup, but you need to document that so that it's not confused with a requirement versus something that needs to be evaluated after. For example, if there are some noise issues that you need to look at, your new installation includes some, you know, general safety issues that can include um, n noise issues and maybe upon startup is when you can actually conduct that study and, and evaluation and determine whether it's adequate, then those types of things should be documented um, as an after, uh, after startup so that it's clear to personnel, to regulators, to everyone um, what the intent of that, of that checklist is. Okay, and then maybe a good idea to reference your PSSR completion requirement in the MOC procedure, which we, we've, we've touched on. Uh, implementation, management of change, and pre-startup safety review. Many of these deficiencies can be fixed through training for facility management and operators, maintenance, contractors, on facility MOC processes. Uh, training should emphasize when the MOC process should be used and incorporate the use of MOCs into the culture uh, of the facility. And although the program is often overseen by one or two personnel uh, for the facility, all operators and managers should be familiar with the MOC process because in one way or, or another, they're going to be responsible for different elements of the program and be responsible for completing different tasks under the MOC. And there's a certain um, flow to the MOC process, so they need to be aware of what, what the target dates are, what they're responsible for. And so, although one person may be the focal point, everyone needs to have an awareness of 
handling changes and, and seeing them through so that a safe start is going to occur. Uh, and training should emphasize roles and responsibilities, which we've discussed in a, pre in a previous slide. Okay, so that is all I have. Uh, we're going to open it up to any questions and answers. Uh, okay, I have a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for the MOC requirement, what about organizational changes, uh, like personnel? Yeah, that is, uh, I believe we mentioned it. Um, I didn't go too much into it, but it was on a slide. And um, OSHA, it's not directly implied in the regulations, but uh, when, actually, I'll go back to this requirement find this. Okay, so where we have here, where it's generally been interpreted, uh, is in the changes to facility. So, owner-operator shall establish and impl implement RIM procedures to manage changes to process chemicals, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and changes to facility. So, we, we kind of discussed this uh, briefly, or I kind of discussed this briefly, and essentially, if you have an organizational change, uh, that can impact the, the, the covered process. Oh, okay. So the question was, uh, thank you. The question was, uh, what about organizational changes uh, as part of the management of change procedure? And uh, if uh, if we go back to the management of change slide, uh, there are uh, you have to implement a written procedure as we discussed for the management of change to uh, to manage changes including changes to facility, which can affect your covered process. So um, OSHA uh, interpretations have uh, considered that, uh, you know, anything that can, any type of change, not limited to equipment, technology, or procedures, or process chemicals, can actually affect the covered process. And so that is organizational uh, changes, and also uh, changes in, in personnel, uh, numbers. So if you significantly reduce your uh, personnel on the cover process, that should be part of the management of change because you need to consider what, how that can affect your, your system, how, how that can affect the function of the process, how that can affect the efficiency, and also obviously the safety impacts. Um, could it create a hazardous environment that needs to be looked at? And uh, if there are organizational changes, if you have key personnel that are shifted and different expertise, uh, obviously, everyone has different capabilities and skills and levels of expertise. Um, and so when, whenever anything, when there is an organizational change, that needs to be uh, encompassed and considered as part of the management of change. How is moving uh, different key personnel and shifting uh, roles and responsibilities going to affect uh, your management of cha uh, your, your process? And that essentially can be uh, looked at through your same management of change procedure, but it would just be encompassing organizational impacts. We don't have any further questions. Okay. Uh, there was a comment also that maybe when you mentioned or emphasized that this is not our talking startup, but a small company, and the action I asked for that. So we're trying to move. Oh, okay. That's a good point. Um, there was a comment in the audience um, emphasizing the importance of pre-startup safety uh, review for um, starting up equipment that has been uh, out of uh, operation. And also, I'm sorry, can you, the second part? Yeah, and closing out action items. So uh, we, we kind of touched on the PHA. Uh, the process hazard analysis, if you have, if it's a new system, if it's a modified system, uh, and it's significant enough to change, uh, to modify your process safety information or different procedural uh, uh, elements, then obviously you want to conduct uh, a, a process hazard review analysis. And uh, there may be recommendations that result from that, so that is always going to be an important part of the PSSR, verifying that those recommendations have been closed out and resolved. Um, and especially for equipment that has been out of service, there are certain checks that need to be made. 
um, for bringing it back online, and that's where your PSSR comes into play. And you you may also have your you know your design spec checklist that can go along with that to ensure a safe startup. Another comment was that uh, STEM addresses changes in health. Okay. Um, so there was a comment. We didn't focus on STEMs too much. Uh, just because that was like a previous, uh, that was our previous uh, webinar. But um, a lot of the regulations that apply to onshore, obviously, uh, they actually mirror the SEMS program, which is for offshore applications. And their PSSR uh, is actually itemized uh, organizational changes and, and facility uh, personnel changes as part of their requirements. So that was one, one comment that a viewer pointed out. Um, do you have an example set of the most effective MOC PSSR policies, major concerns that we have? Um, yeah, we can send. We we, we do definitely have a, a template, um, and obviously that needs to just be evaluated at face value. Oh, yeah. So there was a question if we have uh, like a, a template or standardized form uh, that addresses the MOC uh, forms and requirements for implementation. And we do have uh, a form that uh, line, has a line item of, of each of the requirements and satisfies them as well as some additional um, details. And that can be provided, but it would just be, you know, taking that face value and you have to kind of modify that to fit your organizational structure because you may have more de uh, departments and you may want to break up the management of change form for something that works for you. So uh, that's definitely something that we can help in, an area we can help in, and it would just be uh, making it site-specific for the facility, though, so that it's an effective management of change. Same gentleman is asking whether we have that. <laughs> we can talk to the gentleman <laughs> and see what his needs are, and then um, I'm sure we can we can help out. Yes, we develop programs for these uh, for the risk management plan, the CalArp, uh, the PSM, and also for STEM applications. So uh, we definitely have experience in that area. Okay. All right, well, thank you for tuning in. And if you have any other follow-up questions, you can feel free to email us. Um, I think you all should have actually gotten my email from the uh, presentation that was sent out. So just feel free to contact me with any questions. And otherwise, I think uh, we're ready to go. Yeah, thanks.